Okay, Nick Collier again, and it's story time. We're in my, uh, kind of my gallery. Uh, these are all paintings that I've done over the past, probably maybe in the past year or two. Uh, and uh, what I want you to do is just visualize um, suburbia, 1959. The lawns are all mowed, the, tr the rose gardens are all trimmed, the houses are freshly painted. It's white America. I mean, it's snow white. There isn't a black person, there isn't a uh, Mexican, there isn't anybody within miles of this one little uh, suburban housing track called Fairway Park and that's where I lived right in the middle of Fairway Park and uh, behind me in the middle of this quaint beautiful well-kept uh, suburban uh, neighborhood of maybe oh, a couple of two or three hundred houses uh, out in the middle of, um, of uh, uh, tomato fields sat myself and right behind me Mr. Freeman and his three kids Kenny, Melvin and Sally Freeman. Now you have to understand uh, this was suburbia in 59 they weren't even they weren't even thinking about anything but their their nice lawns and and new Cadillacs. Now, in the middle of this beauty of this uh, perfection, sat Mr. Freeman and his three kids, and uh, and if you can just imagine the house with three cars pulled, three dead cars pulled up on the front lawn with uh, motorcycles laying on, the, on their side, you know, dead motorcycles that had been laying there for, uh, you know, a year or five years. Um, you go into the garage, it is packed full. I mean, there's just barely walking room in between the what uh, you know what m went for a garage there were no cars in there it was just full of crap and uh, you walked out back and you literally from the fence to the building it was just loaded with stuff backyard the same thing around the side of the house the same thing I mean you couldn't move you go in the house and it's just chaos. I mean, I, I, I couldn't understand how that they could live that way. And, uh, but Mr. Freeman, and you know, he took care of his kids. He went to a job every day. I think he was an architect for, a, you know, some firm in, in Oakland. And uh, when he came home, he would sit at his kitchen table, and sitting on his kitchen table was some sculpture, or a painting, or a piece of ceramic, or something that he was working on. And he would have these beautiful pieces that he'd be, you know, uh, sculpting, or uh, you know, he'd have his torches in the kitchen and he'd be welding together some kind of beautiful uh, shape sculpture. I, I remember uh, he, he did this, this nude piece of this woman standing, you know, kind of, you know, in a, in a very uh, poetic pose. And he did the whole thing out of wire. And uh, uh, that is what the house looked like. It wasn't junk that was in the, in the garage 
or in the kitchen or in the living room or in the backyard. It was art. And there were sculptures and there were things that he was going to make into sculptures. Uh, there was, you know, ceramics and there was paintings and there were, I mean, it was just an, a full array of things. And here would be Mr. Freeman. And every free day he would just sit at his kitchen table and work on something. Or maybe he might go out into the garage and work on something. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I've, I first started going over there. I was probably about eight years old. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I was pretty impressed. I mean, I didn't see that, that his house was a disaster. What I saw was there was all these really interesting things everywhere. And, you know, I went back to my house and it was uh, pristine. And, you know, there was a swimming pool in the backyard. And, and uh, my dad had little fuchsias hanging from the from the uh, overhang on, on the patio. Uh, but there was, it was chaos, and it was this kind of beautiful chaos that I, I really appreciated. And I spent as much time as I could over at Mr. Freeman's house, uh, hanging out with Kenny, mostly, because Kenny and I were best pals. And we got into a lot of trouble during that time. Uh, Mr. Freeman, here, I'm going to sit down. I mean, he was constantly uh, involved in something. And <laughs> this one time, uh, you know, Mr. Freeman, and, and by the way, he took me with them to all of these adventures. We went up to Lick Observatory one time. It was like a 40-mile drive back on this country road to the top of this mountain in San Jose. And, and we looked at the moon, and we looked at uh, Jupiter, and, and we looked at Saturn uh, through these giant telescopes that were made in the 1800s. They're still up there, but they don't let you look at them anymore. Uh, not the public. And, uh, you know, he'd take us to all of these different places. We, we went to Yosemite for a, a bunch of time. We went to a new beach once. I mean, you, know, you got to remember, 59, new beach. It was pretty cool. <laughs> of course, my parents never knew any of this stuff. Uh, so this one time, Mr. Freeman takes us into Oakland, and we're hanging out around Lake Merritt, which is... There's pretty good size lake, maybe, oh, you know, 100 acres. And there's this lawn area around the entire lake and a little walk, a little concrete walk area. And, uh, and so we're sitting there having a picnic and having a good time. And, and Mr. Freeman pulls out this little pouch and brings out this little chunk. And he says, hey, guess what this is? And uh, yeah, Kenny knew exactly what it was. I didn't know, I had no idea. He says, well, it's sodium. Uh, Kenny said that. And uh, so Mr. Freeman said, oh, okay, well, here, throw it in the lake. And I, I'm like, well, okay, sodium in the lake, big deal. So he throws it, uh, Kenny throws it in the lake out of, you know, about 20 yards out. And in about 30 seconds, the entire lake erupts. Not the entire lake, but one whole section of the lake, maybe six feet, erupts into this volcano of water. And it goes up, you know, 40, 50 feet in the air. And it's just this huge explosion. And I was like, whoa, what is that? And he, that was one of his, uh, one of his, uh, you might say, lessons. He says sodium. Sodium it, by itself is nothing. Mixed with uh, H2O, sodium becomes very explosive. And you know, that kind of stuck in my mind. And I, you know, I, we finished the picnic. We had a great time. He probably killed all the fish in the general area with the explosion. Uh, 
we finished the picnic, we went back home, and you know, it was a couple of weeks later, and Kenny and I, uh, his dad is at work, and Kenny and I are at the house by ourselves, and we're, you know, we're always looking for trouble. And uh, so he, Kenny says, oh man, I know where that sodium is, let's, let's get the sodium and put it in a coffee can out in the middle of the street and blow it up. You know, so, oh yeah, hey, let's do that. <laughs> And so Kenny gets a little chunk of sodium, maybe the size of a, oh, I don't know, a quarter, except it's round. Um, so we get a coffee can, fill the coffee, a two-pound coffee can, fill the coffee can with water, drop the sodium in and run, and kind of hide behind a, uh, one of the cars. And, uh, you know, 30 seconds later, Bang! The sodium just explodes. Every bit of water in that can just fans out into a mist in the entire, close to the entire neighborhood. Well, what we didn't know was sodium, when mixed with water, uh, is very explosive. But when it explodes, it turns into lye. <laughs> Nobody could figure out why all their brand new cars had the paint jobs with these little speckles all over it. We weren't saying a word. <laughs> I mean, those are the crazy things that we did. You know, another time Kenny uh, got a go-kart. Oh man, the go-kart was cold. And so we're racing around the streets in the go-kart. You know, day in and day out. I'm sure we drove the neighbors nuts. But then, you know, when Mr. Freeman was home, uh, things were a little calmer for one, and we weren't getting in as much trouble. And, uh, and uh, you know, he'd be sitting at his, at his kitchen table, a uh, cup of coffee in hand, a cigarette in the other hand, and working on something. And every time I went in there, I went, wow, what is he doing? But the interesting thing is, is he never finished one thing. He'd get it almost all the way done and then lose interest and on to a new, new process. Now, you know, the Freemans were the scourge of the neighborhood and I loved them. The, you know, the entire neighborhood just, you know, shunned the Freemans. Well, fact is, is Mr. Freeman didn't give a rat's ass about the neighbors in 1959. And uh, at one point, uh, and, and his wife had left him years earlier and left him with the kids. And it was, you know, he was just a single guy doing the best he could. And at one point he met this woman and he brought her over and she started living with him. Now the problem was, is we're talking about white America here. We're talking about lily white. And what's he bring home? A black girl. And she lives with him for, oh, I don't know, three or four years they were together. And the entire neighborhood just came undone at the seams. And, uh, but you know, it didn't, uh, it didn't, phase him one bit, but the entire neighborhood was just up in arms. Nobody did anything, nobody said anything, but you know, you could tell that there was a tension going on. <laughs> so, you know, he brings this black girl in and uh, they, they're living together in harmony for a while. And then uh, after a while, she needed to leave and she couldn't. You know, she'd try to leave and then she'd come back. And then she'd try to leave and then she'd come back. And well, that must have went on for, oh, a good year or so. And at one point, she, in order to burn the house down, in order to leave and never come back, she threw acid in his face. I was like, really? And, uh, you know, he, he was totally scarred after that. He, I think he lost an eye. You know, their space was all messed up. Um, by the time I left 
Fairway Park, which was about about 15, I think I I started, you know, getting out into the world. Uh, he was pretty shattered, uh, still sitting at his table, and he was oh maybe 45 when he died. You know, it was a it was a sad state because for one, I was too young to understand what had happened. You know that. He was this gem uh, in this in this sea of mediocrity, and uh, so his influence caused me to be what I am today. Um, and uh, the art you see behind you has every time I pick up a brush. I think of him. And that's the story of Mr. Freeman and the Freeman household. Nick Collier, checking out.